Larimar is a small town located 431 kilometres, or a five-hour drive from the territorial capital of Darwin. It's flat and featureless, just about as remote as you get. The nearest grocery store is 90 kilometres away. It's hot and it's dry, and the local pub has a few crocodiles. In this tiny town live 10 people, and a pretty significant secret. The sun was setting on December 16, 2017, when a man named Paddy Moriarty decided to leave Pink Panther Hotel. It had been a sweltering day and he'd knocked back 10 or so beers at the local pub, a few more than his average. He embarked on the two-minute ride home with his Kelpie named Kelly sitting beside him on his quad bike. And then he disappeared into thin air, along with Kelly. This town, with a handful of homes, a tea house, deadly animals and sinkholes, was nothing like it seemed. And one of their own had gone missing. Suddenly, everyone was looking at Larimer. And just when it seemed like the story couldn't get any stranger, it did. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In this episode, I'm speaking with journalist Kylie Stevenson. Kylie was co host of the Walkley Award winning podcast produced by The Australian, Lost in Larimer, alongside Caroline Graham. Ever since Patty went missing in late 2017, Kylie has had personal and professional interest in the case, having met Patty by chance a year earlier. Let's start with the tiny town of Larimer, if you'd even call it a town. You've actually been there. How would you describe it? Um, It's a very small town. It has a population that hovers around 10. It hasn't really gone over 20 for probably the last 50 years or so. And it's pretty much, well, it depends on who you ask. I would say it's the middle of nowhere. The people who live there would call it the middle of everywhere because you're kind of smack bang between Darwin and Tennant Creek. Uh, So it's about 500k south of Darwin. And it's a very hot place. It's very um, isolated. There's no mobile phone reception. Uh, The town is just kind of a gathering of probably a dozen houses, uh, a pub, and that's pretty much it. And how about the residents? What type of person chooses to live in Larimer? Most of the residents in Larimer have been there for quite some time. So most of them moved there sort of in the 80s or 90s and they've stayed on there. So the average age in Larimer is probably about 70, I would say, There is one younger couple who are in their 40s and 50s who moved there only three or so years ago. And then you have sort of a few people who come through working at the pub uh, and and some of them stick around for a long time. A lot of them return, a lot of them leave and come back quite a few times. And that's pretty much it. And what's um, interesting about this town of uh, around 11 people is that their attentions. And I think we have an idyllic view in Australia of these small towns that are, you know, have a real sense of community and really get along. But in this particular place, there's a lot of conflict. Why is it that groups of people don't necessarily get along or or haven't in the last five years or so? It dates back a lot longer than that, actually. Uh, So it kind of started back in the 90s when there was a progress association in town, which was very Uh, active in the community and trying to get new projects up and running. The area is actually an old World War II site. So there's a lot of history around that area. And that was a big focus of the Progress Association. But what happened is that there ended up being quite a few members of the same family in the town. And they sort of, I guess, had the power in the Progress Association and some other people didn't agree with their decisions. So they formed a rival Progress Association, which is kind of interesting in a town of back then, I think it was about 20 of them. And it just sort of sparked off from there. And uh, there's been, 
you know, a lot of arguments. There are people who haven't spoken to each other for 15 years, even though they live across the road from one another. Um, there are people who sort of have been known to abuse each other in the street. Uh, some people refuse to go to the pub, so they will drive the 70 k's north to Mataranka to pick up their mail or to pick up some milk, things like that. So it's a difficult place to be in conflict with other people because if you need to borrow something urgently or you need assistance in some way, you're kind of stuck. You have a long way to go to get that. Is Larima somewhere where tourists would stop by on the way to somewhere? Like is it a um, a stop-off uh, around that sort of Darwin area or is it quite insular? No, it is a place where a lot of tourists go. It's kind of – it's 70k south of Mataranka. So once you've left Mataranka between there and Daly Waters, there's not a lot. Larima is it. Um, so a lot of people do stop in there specifically to go to the pub. The pub is very well known. It's known as the Pink Panther. It's painted bright pink and there are uh, lots of stuffed pink panthers and a, a very large concrete statue of a pink panther out the front and a big statue of an old Darwin stubby, which was a two-litre beer that they used to sell in the Northern Territory. And back in the 70s, I think the Larimer Hotel had the record for selling the most uh, Darwin stubbies. So they've got a bit of a tribute out the front of the pub. And I guess people are attracted to the quirkiness of the place. So there are a lot of tourists who stop in there. There's a great little museum as well. So that kind of pulls a few people who are interested in that war history, particularly into the town. And you know, in the dry season, there are just hundreds of thousands of people driving up and down the Stewart Highway, and it's right on the Stewart Highway. You don't have to drive very far off the main road to get to the pub, and yeah, it's a pretty good place to stop in and have a drink. Now, I want to get to Paddy Moriarty. Uh, you actually met him, didn't you? I did, yes. What was he like? Uh, he was a nice guy. I spent two weeks down in Larimar in 2016 as part of a writing retreat put on by the NT Writers Centre and Paddy would come to the pub every day. So he would help out there in the morning. He'd be raking leaves or he'd be chopping wood or um, cleaning out the toilet block, things like that, which he did uh, for payment of a case of beer a week, I believe. And then he would sort of around midday wander into the pub and that was generally I would sort of come out of my room where I've been writing all morning and I'd have have a drink or have something to eat and sit and have a chat with Paddy. And he was just, you know, a typical outback guy, um, an old cowboy who'd retired in this small town and and had lots of stories to tell and was really friendly. Paddy's a good bloke, decent Aussie fella. Um, come over here from Ireland, as we all know now. <coughs> Excuse me, cigarette smoke. Um, mate, he loved this country. He loved this area. Um, he was happy as a pig in shit here. He had everything he ever wanted. Um, he was a man, like, the only thing he wanted apart from what he had was one of them Rolex watches. That's it. And that's all Paddy ever like aspired to, apart from what he had. Um, he's a good worker, good, decent, honest bloke. Um, bit of a shit stirrer, but isn't the average Aussie. And he hadn't married or anything, did he? So he didn't have kids or, or a family there? He didn't. Um, he did tell me and had told uh, the people he was close to in Larimer that he did have children from a relationship that he had had when he was a young man when he first arrived in Australia. Uh, but when uh, he, he disappeared, the police did look into that and were unable to find his name on any birth certificate anywhere. So I think those children do exist, but I don't know that he had a lot to do with our upbringing. Now, Paddy disappeared in December 2017. What do we know about his last known movements? So on Saturday the 16th of December at around 6pm, he decided to leave the pub. He'd been over there drinking. He'd stayed a little bit later than usual. He usually sort of cleared out of the pub around four in the afternoon. But this night he was, you know, there were a few tourists around, which is unusual for that time of year. So he hung around, was having a chat and having a couple of extra beers. And at about 6 p.m., him and his dog, Kelly, they jumped on the, uh, Paddy's quad bike and just drove over the road to his house, which is just over the other side of the Stuart Highway from where the pub is. 
And one of the last people to see him was a tourist who had taken a bit of a liking to Kelly, the dog, and offered Patty the leftover remains of a barbecue chicken that they had and said, take it home for the dog. So he, he went home with the chicken and that was, that was the last anyone heard of him. Do you remember that day in particular? And do you remember what his demeanour was like on the day? I do remember that day. Um, I can't tell you exactly what day it was. I thought it was Friday. The cop was the told it was Saturday. So, okay, that's fair enough. Um, it's pretty much like a time warp for you. Every day's the same. But, mate, he was just the same. Happy, content. He was just going to turn up the next day and get the lawnmower and that's it. Simple as that. So, yeah. Like, you know, he had his second last beer and said as he always done, well, I think I'll have my last supper this time, Richard, which is his last beer, and I think I'm done for this evening. So got on his motorbike with his dog, mate, and floated off home. Do you think he was heavily intoxicated? Uh, I wouldn't say heavily, no way. No, um, slight wobbly boot on, but um, then again, what is it? Uh, half past two in the afternoon, and I've got a slight wobbly boot on, so that's not unusual for up here. So, but yeah, no, we keep our shit tight, we always do. I want to go through some possibilities of what might have happened to him. Is it possible that he wandered off? It's definitely possible and it was the initial thought uh, when police began investigating this. They thought they were investigating a medical situation where he might have just gone to take the dog for a walk and had a heart attack or perhaps been bitten by a snake or something like that. So that's what they were looking into initially. When they started checking the tracks around his house that he was known to use and there was no sign of him, that's when things started to get a little bit stranger, I guess. Um, That's sort of when they started to realise that perhaps this hadn't been a misadventure. He... It's very doubtful he would have gotten lost. He knew the area very well. He was he lived in the bush for most of his life. And where he lives, to find your way back to Larama if you did wander out in the bush, is actually pretty easy because you can hear the traffic on the Stuart Highway. So it's unlikely he got lost and it started to seem very unlikely that it was a medical episode when they were unable to locate him. There are a number of, of dangers, I suppose, um, around that area that might not exist in a city. One of them, um, the theories that was raised, I believe, was um, that he'd fallen victim to a sinkhole. Uh, What is a sinkhole and and why didn't that ultimately add up? So I guess a sinkhole is just a depression in the earth that is kind of ready to crumble and if you happen to step on it at the wrong time, you might fall in. People told us that there are a lot of sinkholes around Larimer. There's stories on how deep they would be varied. Most people said they would, they would, you know, you could see the bottom. But then a couple of people did have stories about ones where, you know, they, they'd gotten ropes and climbed down in there and found a cave underneath and things like that. But that kind of thing would have a wide opening. So you would be able to look down and see if a person had fallen in. Um, and no one in the search parties located any holes like that. So I guess... One of the things that also makes it unlikely is that a man and a dog just happen to step on that exact bit of earth that's about to give way and both of them fall in and it's so deep that they can't be seen and so narrow that no one notices there's a hole there. So that kind of ruled that out of the equation. And that was an important detail from the beginning, wasn't it? That it wasn't just him, it was also his dog, which even if it had been a snake bite or, you know, something had had gone wrong or there'd been misadventure, then you would assume the dog would be okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess in these kind of cases, usually a dog will stay with its owner or it will return to where it's from looking for food. And in those initial days of the search, obviously that's a big thing they were looking for. They did believe from very early on that Paddy would not be found alive. So they weren't necessarily looking for a person when they were searching, uh, particularly from the helicopter, they were looking for movement of a dog um, in addition to looking for a body and and there was just no sign of that. Because it was also the conditions in terms of how hot it is that time of, of year that if you did get lost then your chances of surviving for very long are, are quite small. And what other sort of animals are around that area? Because even in the pub there was like a, a crocodile, wasn't there? 
Uh, yes, at the pub there is a pet crocodile named Sneaky Sam. He's a three and a half metre salty. I guess in the beginning there were a lot of bizarre rumours going around about what might have happened to Paddy, so police did have to look into everything and they did uh, give Sneaky Sam the all clear that, that uh, someone hadn't thrown him in there or anything like that. Uh, there are crocodiles kind of in the area, but December is very early in the wet season. So if you were to find a crocodile that far up the river system, it does join the Roper River system, it would have to be very late after a very big wet season. It would be reasonably unusual, I would say. Would anyone in Larimar have motive in terms of t- intensely disliking Paddy to potentially do something? Did anyone really, really hate him? Well, that was something that quite surprised me about Paddy after having met him, that he did have a few enemies, not just in Larimar, but um, also further afield. Uh, He did have a rivalry with the woman who lived across the road from him. Uh, She runs uh, probably what is Australia's most remote Devonshire tea house. And they had had a long running stoush that had landed them in court. She was often accusing Paddy of uh, damaging her property and things like that. And and Paddy was doing some pretty awful things to her. Um, the last time she saw him, uh, she said that he was dragging a kangaroo across the highway and he threw it in her yard, a, a dead kangaroo that had been killed on the road. He threw it into her yard under her window so that she would have to deal with this rotting corpse of a kangaroo. So there was definitely some fractures there. I've had trouble with him all along, big, big trouble. Like last year I took him to court for uh, poisoning my garden. I've had so many things and it's all been reported to the police. They got it on record. He started stirring shit around town about what I was doing in the kitchen and how much I was selling my pies for and oh, I was this and it was that because he was very jealous, you see, very jealous of what I've got here and... And plus um, the pub, I'm opposition to the pub. A few other people in town were probably less friendly with him. I wouldn't say enemies, but had definitely had confrontations with him over the years. He was known to be a bit of a larrikin, a bit of a stirrer. And that had happened in previous towns he'd lived in as well across the Northern Territory. There were people that he'd definitely gotten on the wrong side of. That's a good way to put it, I think, a stirrer, because there was some conflict over the pies, wasn't there? Because Fran, even on, I believe he was on the ABC years before, talking about the cost of Fran's pies, is that correct? Yeah, so Fran Hodges is the woman who runs the tea house, his neighbour across the road, and she sells the most incredible menu of pies, crocodile pies, buffalo pies, uh, and the pub also sold pies and Paddy was obviously mates with Barry Sharp, who was the former publican who was selling those pies over there. And he actually put a sign up in his yard directing people to the pub for pies. And he would he would often tell people if they pulled up out the front of Fran's place and he happened to be around, he'd say to them, don't go in there. You know, this, this is going to make you sick. Don't go in. And you know, you can see why that might get to Fran. That That's a pretty awful thing to do to someone who's trying to run a, a business in a really remote area in really difficult conditions. So, yeah, the pies did become a bit of a focus. There, there's a long history of pie wars in Larimar. Paddy didn't really have uh, any enemies. The only one he used to argue with was the lady in the pie shop. Here's the two pies for you, darling. I was the first one ever to make pies in the Territory. Buffalo, camel, pork. I mince my own meat here. I mince my own pork and chicken. Before his disappearance, Paddy Moriarty had spoken to the ABC multiple times about his life in Larimar, and he didn't hold back his opinions about Fran or her pies. Fran's has got the worst pies, and I fucking tell you that. Oh, there was shit over there. I used to true. I used to go over there and and the dog wouldn't eat me pie. Fran's pies. Yeah. True word. And this has got chunky meat and everything like that here. Yeah. And I tell people. I tell them the truth. Bloody hell. When they pull up at my place up at the road. Yeah. I tell them fair dinkum. Yeah. 
And that's what happens when Franz is the worst gas bagger in town. And who was Owen Laurie? Um, and what sort of interactions had he had with Patty? So Owen was Fran Hodgett's gardener. He was living on her property and tending to her yard. Uh, he'd only been in town about three months when Patty disappeared. And I guess because of the problems that Fran had with Patty, he was drawn into that a little bit. He he spoke, uh, there has been an inquest into Patty's disappearance and Owen spoke at that inquest and he he just kind of said, look, you know, I was hearing every day about all these horrible things that he'd done, that Patty had done to Fran. And I guess the other thing that made people a bit wary of Owen was just the fact that he had lived there for three months and no one knew him. He was very much someone who kept to himself, very private. He didn't really leave Fran's house. He never went to the pub. So a lot of people in town said, we wouldn't even know him if we saw him. We wouldn't even know what he looked like. And I believe it was at the inquest, Owen and Fran had, um, they say jokingly, had said to Patty things like, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to shut your dog up or something like that. Was was that actually discussed in the courtroom? It was, yeah. So Fran has probably said that a few times and she admits it was always just one of those off-the-cuff things that you say when someone's someone's frustrating you, you know, oh, I'm going to kill him, you know, he's driving me mad. Uh, with Owen, they Owen and Patty had had a couple of confrontations, uh, particularly to do with their dogs. So dogs, uh, Patty's dog Kelly had wandered over the road a few times and I think that had annoyed Owen. Uh, he, had, he had a dog as well and Fran had two dogs. And I guess that kind of language around, you know, making threats. I don't necessarily think that they were um, threats that anyone intended to follow through on. It's just that kind of thing, or certainly what they said in court was, it's just that kind of thing that you say when you're incredibly frustrated and angry at someone. Do we know what either of them were doing on the night that Patty went missing? Ooh, good question. Um, I believe Fran was away. I, I believe she was in Darwin for a few days uh, and returned a couple of days later. Owen was around and it did come out in the inquest that he had been in the phone box, which is on the highway, uh, directly across from Patty's house and out the front of Fran's. Uh, he had been in the phone box and it's believed that would have been around the time that Patty would have been coming back from the pub on his quad bike. Now, this area had actually had people go missing before, hadn't it? Because I believe I read that Fran had served a man once years ago, which there's not been any proven connection, but it it's likely a coincidence, but that she'd served a man who later went missing. Is there something about that area where it, it could be potentially, you know, a serial killer or, or someone who has randomly chosen people? Yeah, I think that's one of those things that everyone sort of throws up as an idea because there are so many people that go missing on the Stuart Highway. But what you need to remember is that the Stuart Highway is enormous and that a lot of the roads going off the Stuart Highway, someone might go missing off one of those, but it's kind of lumped in as happening in the Stuart Highway. Um, Fran did serve a man. Uh, his name was Jamie Herdman, uh, a New Zealand man who went missing, uh, last seen at Daily Waters. Um, and there was another uh, missing persons case just a couple of years before Patty, a woman called Joanne Anderson in Mataranka who went missing and uh, neither of those people have ever ever been found. Um, they're both still, I guess, open cases for the police to investigate. Did police have any um, official suspects when it came to Patty? There's no official suspects but certainly people have been questioned uh, I know that Fran and Owen have both been questioned quite significantly. I know that Fran's uh, septic tank and incinerator were both searched. Her house was searched, but nothing was found. No, there's been no evidence linking anyone to this crime. So there's no official suspects, but certainly I imagine the police have people that they, um, you know, have questioned at different times. 
Fran, though, says she's the one in the copper's sights. I said, you're treating me like an animal. And I don't like and it. And why is that, Fran? Because they've come here how many times? They've been here five times as I'm with warrants. They scraped my incinerator out. They pumped my septic out, my large septic, thinking Paddy was down there. Mine, at the bottom of my steps. They done my house out three times. Do you swear that you have nothing I to swear on my mother's grave and my father's grave been dead for 40, 50 years and my grandkids, I've got nine grandkids, and I can swear on their life that Owen and I never left this property, had nothing to do with Paddy, don't know where he is. I'm interested in why you think this story received international coverage because it was covered by the New York Times, the Irish Times, a bunch of other publications. What about the story do you think captured, you know, the the attention of people overseas when it's such a remote community? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I think there are three things that are really unusual about the case. One is that there was nothing disturbed in Paddy's house. So it was as if he'd just walked out the back door and been swallowed up by the landscape. There's just his key card, his keys, his glasses, his hat, everything uh, was in his house. His dinner was on the table as if he was about to heat it up. Um, so that's one thing that's quite curious that someone can just walk out their back door and never come back. The second thing is the dog and as we spoke about before, it's really unusual for a man and a dog to go missing. If a person goes missing, generally it will the dog will return or will be, you know, will be found with its owner, um, whether or not the person is deceased. So that was another thing. And I think probably the thing that has really captured people is the town and its size. There aren't that many towns with just, you know, a dozen people as their whole population. And this place is so isolated and it's, you know, that outback kind of place. You know, if you looked at Larimer at the at the hotel, you would think it was someone had created it for a movie about the outback. It's just a really iconic Australian, you know, old school pub. And I think that people kind of find just that area of Australia quite fascinating. And then the fact that this tiny town has so many fractures is also something that has, I guess, captured people's interest. How has the town changed since Paddy disappeared? I think for a long time uh, it was a bit of a a sad place. It It felt quite subdued after Paddy had disappeared. So um, Caroline and I went down there three months after Patty's disappearance and we spent a bit of time there talking to everyone. And there was just kind of, I guess, a sense of sadness because there was something missing, particularly at the pub where Patty had been every day and everyone was used to seeing him. Um, and since then, uh, the former publican, Barry Sharp, he's passed away. Uh, there are still the same other people are sort of around Fran, she's moved uh, interstate. Her son is running her tea ha- uh, Sorry, her grandson is running her tea house. Uh, so there have been a few changes um, around there, but it's still basically the same people, uh, yeah, doing the same things they were always doing, mostly, mostly retired and just, you know, I guess have chosen that kind of lifestyle and are living their lives there. And finally, I'm interested if you think we'll ever know for sure who was responsible for Paddy's death with the the um, inquest and uh, police looking more closely and as you say there's there's obviously you know a lot that the police know that we might not um, do you think they'll come to a conclusion or do you think there just isn't enough evidence available for us to to ever really know what happened to him it's one of those things I guess you look at other cases, particularly around this area, and the chances of finding a body in country like that, you know, it's so flat and expansive and, you know, there's just no reason for people to be out there in a lot of those places. So the chances of someone stumbling across his remains at some point does feel quite slim, Uh, especially when you look at cases like Peter Falconio, 
uh, like those two previous cases I mentioned, Joanne Anderson and Jamie Herdman. You know, I guess, and then with the passage of time, being out in the elements, what would actually be left um, would not be a lot. So, you know, one, the chances of people, someone coming across it are slim, and then two, that there would be that much left that anyone would even notice what it was. Uh, you know, that you've got a lot of wild animals out there. You've got pigs, you've got wild donkeys, you've got uh, birds of prey. They're all going to really diminish your chances of finding anything substantial, particularly as time goes on. But I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, I guess that has happened before too. There have been cases where people have been missing for many years and and someone does stumble upon their remains and it just kind of depends on luck really if if someone you know comes across something they're out you know building fences on the cattle station or they're you know out bush bashing or something like that um but then again even if a body is found the chances of there being a conviction as a result of that are probably growing slimmer as time goes on and i guess it's just a one of those cases that might just remain a mystery. Just to follow up, do you think that there's any chance at all that that this was misadventure and that no one else was involved? I think that's always a possibility. I guess with every possibility that you look at in this case, every one of them seems so far fetched and slim that you you don't you can't kind of rule anything out. So I guess with misadventure, um, the thing that kind of steers you away from that theory is Kelly, the dog. Um, the dog would have been found. If we're talking about him having some kind of medical episode or, or having wandered off and gotten lost, um, and then you're sort of relying on a dog doing something that people typically say a dog doesn't do and just running off into the wild. And they've done it's all that, that um, they followed up to see if the dog had appeared in any animal shelters or if anyone had picked the dog up. They they sort of did uh, a big search for the dog and that didn't turn anything up, which would be unusual too. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we also rang around a lot of animal shelters when we were making our podcast and um, we did find a Kelpie that we fo- briefly thought was uh, Kelly, but th- that turned out not to be the case. So. Yeah, I think the dog is kind of the thing that makes those kind of accidental deaths improbable. It's still possible, but unlikely. Mm, Unlikely. That's exactly right. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for having me. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Our executive producer is Elise Cooper with additional production by Hannah Bowman. You can find a link for Kylie's podcast, Lost in Larimer, in the show notes for this episode. If you'd like to find out more about the show, don't forget to join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join. 